Maybe my first comment would be uh, in terms of uh, getting new technology, I think it's Africa. We have made some strides. And what is very interesting is that there are some phases of technological transition that other countries went through that Africa jumped. For instance, mobile money. Uh, we never used those. We didn't grow up in the generation of, of, of the Asian telegrams that I saw in Potsdam at the Einstein Center. So those are some of the positive elements that we can pick from there. My presentation today, I'll be focusing on the policy and legal reforms uh, towards turning Malawi's economic fortunes. I'll be presenting about Malawi. We don't really like to be called a poor country, but we rather like to be called a small economy, because that gives us hope that uh, we have a, all the opportunity and the space to grow. Um, so I'll be looking at the overview of the country, the challenges, measures being taken currently. I'll also look at the economic um, growth projections and why Malawi should be chosen as a place for foreign direct investment. And I'll also talk about the key uh, reforms. So this is, the, this is the country called Malawi. Uh, it has three neighbors, Zambia, Mozambique, and Tanzania. It's about 118,000 square kilometers. And 20% um, of that is fresh water bodies. We brag that we have the best freshwater body in the world. We used to offer the longest freshwater marathon in the world, yachting marathon in the world. And we have, if you look at the species that we have, the fish species that we have, all the lakes and bodies, water bodies in Europe combined can't meet the number of species. So this has made the country one of the major centers of attraction for for, for research. Yeah, some of the um, indicators are not inspiring at all. Like we currently trading the US dollar to a quarter at 1,697. Our nominal GDP stands at, uh, is expected to grow a little bit this year from 2.8 to 3.8. Eight, as we are recovering from the, the exogenic shocks that we experienced in the past uh, few years, the pandemic and the war in, in Ukraine. Literacy, we are moving from a really not doing very well at 62%. And with a population size of 20 million, I'll be talking more about that. And life expectancy currently at 64 and Human Development Index at 0.483. Our Corruption Perception Index, we are really doing good because we beat a lot of many countries, Asia, Africa, and some in Latin America. And uh, it might also be great to mention at this point that Malawi remains one of the most peaceful countries in the world, state and progressive democracy, I think we are number seven, if not eight, in the most peaceful uh, countries um, in Africa. So why am I starting with the challenges? I'm starting my presentation with the challenges because I'll be looking at these challenges as to what informed our um, reforms that I'll be talking about later in terms of policy and uh, and 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 league under. Uh, and, and, and the legal framework. Our macroeconomic constraints, co constraints rather, continue to be there like public debt stress. We really borrow a lot to finance our socioeconomic programs. Foreign reserves at some point, I think as at the end of last year, we had about one, no, 2.7 uh, import cover which was kind of uh, 
making our business captains a little bit disturbed. And uh, inflation was also rising. I'll be showing you the figures very soon. And over-reliance on the uh, official development assistance was also a big problem. Our agriculture sector, which is our mainstay, it really got affected by the climate-induced uh, calamities last year and the other two years beyond. And now the recovery process has really been a hectic one. Um, in terms of corruption, I've already talked about that. In terms of skilled labor, we could say relatively we are lower in terms of ranking than other uh, countries. Infrastructure has also been a challenge, and those are some of the things that we will be uh, trying to, to look at in this. So as you would see, those are the figures relating to um, inflation. Uh, they're coming from the IMF World Bank and the European Intelligence, uh, Economic Intelligence uh, Unit, uh, rather. And the factors driving that uh, inflation uh, include, like I said, the shocks and uh, prices rising every day, especially in food, uh, and uh, a little bit, of course, in non-food um, uh, areas. So what are some of the measures being put in place? Number one, I'll be talking about the 2024-2025 fiscal budget. We'll focus on recovery and cushioning the economy from the effects of policy, uh, the, the effects of um, uh, climate change. Uh, the monetary policy uh, rate was increased to about two, uh, by 2.0 to 26%. And those that have a little bit of knowledge in economics, you'd, you'd know that 26% as the policy rate is not a very good figure if you look at how other countries are doing. I already talked about the liquidity uh, reserves, which are also not uh, uh, good enough. But all what is being done now is to make sure that there's a response to some of the challenges that I talked about here, making sure that there is uh, there is a kind of more robust uh, fiscal discipline as well as improvement and uh, making sure that uh, the policy, uh, the, the monetary policy is always responding to the uh, demands or the situation in the parallel uh, market. We are also trying to uh, bring on board the, the concept of demographic dividend uh, smart investment in human capital, health, education, and social programs that we think would accelerate uh, uh, growth. Mm, I think I've already talked about some of these things, but now the major thing that we should be talking about here is why should you find Malawi interesting to invest in despite all these challenges that I have uh, talked about. So, Malawi is unique, political stability, competitive labor market in terms of uh, how much you would spend if you hired a Malawian is way lower than how much you would spend if you hired a German. And we know that, we, we, we stay here. And uh, untapped investment opportunities. I'm sorry to use this word, but I think it is allowed. Malawi is considered as the virgin of Southern Africa because we have a lot of resources still underground and it has become the center of mineral exploration. As I'm talking to you now, as you see in the figures, it's really raising a lot of hopes in the region. Yeah, and uh, I talked about the lake already. The other thing is we, um, we offer great tax uh, incentives I think we have given companies, especially a new foreign direct investors who have gone to that extent of even giving them uh, tax breaks or holidays so that they, they kind of get back the money they invested in before we start taxing them. So all these are measures put in place to woo uh, investors. We're also a party to 
investor protection agreements, uh, which I'll also be talking about later in the presentation. And we have also intensified our efforts in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, development. Currently, the major sources of FDI in uh, foreign direct investment in Malawi are India, China, USA, Germany, United Kingdom, South Africa. This is FDI. But in terms of trade, we trade more with our neighbors, Mozambique, South Africa, Zambia, the DRC, Tanzania, and other countries within the Southern African Development Community uh, uh, blog. Um, I'm putting these pictures, sometimes they might not be relevant to what I'm talking about, but I think I'm also trying to advertise how beautiful this country is. So the key investment sectors, if you wanted to go to Malawi and invest, I would, in, I would encourage you to invest in uh, tourism, uh, water development, transport infrastructure, especially roads, uh, agricultural mechanization, energy, uh, transportation, and uh, mining. Uh, for example, we have these major uh, agricultural va value chains that we have really put a lot of effort in, uh, macadamia nuts, wheat, um, aquaculture, fish farming. And like I said earlier, 20% of the country is covered by fresh water. And people who understand these things better than I do, they say if it was well developed, the aquaculture industry would be able to make Malawi export fish reaching the level of Egypt. So that wouldn't be a small thing. And we have also gone into uh, paprika and, uh, and uh, those other things. Mining opportunities exist in gold, uh, uranium, and uh, if you know root oil, is one of the major minerals currently under, currently under exploration. Some of these mines will be opening very soon. And the, the Rutile mine is, is estimated to, to give the country not less than $25 billion uh, within the next, um, uh, it between up to, up to around 25 uh, years from now. And all these areas, we are opening them up for, for investment. And uh, like I said, we remain the virgin in that area. So, so what are the key reforms towards investment promotion? Unlocking economic growth and development requires the alignment of political incentives with development goals. So government support towards private sector growth and development through issuance of a wide array of physical and non-physical incentives. I talked about uh, some of them. Also, private sector participation and implementation of the $257 million program under the Millennium Challenge Corporation from the American government, which is addressing, which is uh, kind of bringing pro projects that will focus on what we are calling accelerated growth uh, corridors. So this is going to open the country to major, uh, you know, ports like in, 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 in Mozambique, where we are now building a Malawi cargo center, as well as in Tanzania at uh, Dar es Salaam, so as to kind of uh, make the country, which is in courts landlocked, have easy access to the sea. We are also streamlining investment processes to improve the ease of the doing business in the country. So if you go to Malawi right now and you want to invest, you're going to have what is known as the one-stop center, where all processes from registration to anything relating to you becoming uh, an investor in Malawi will be done under uh, one roof. We also have a 16-member presidential private sector council and the Cabinet Committee on Public-Private Partnership. These are presidential initiatives with the aim 
of making sure that the climate remains convenient for uh, our investors. So, we are a liberalized economy, a market economy. So if you come to Malawi, just know that uh, there will be no those restrictions or like non-tariff non barriers, like no, you cannot export this, you cannot do this. Our prices respond to trends on the global uh, market. And um, we have also established what we are calling the export processing zones. So the export processing zones are supported by the 1990, 1995 Act, which has undergone several amendments to attract export-oriented in our industry. So if you come to invest in Malawi and your major purpose is to export, we are going to give you land and uh, in an area where you choose and you benefit from a lot of uh, uh, in in incentives um, in the process. A foreigner in Malawi can invest in any sector of the economy unless declared otherwise by ministry, let's say military or thing that could be deemed dangerous. You can own land under leasehold agreements, make international payments on your loans and interest without any restrictions. You can make unrestricted payments on management contracts, a royalty payments, and any other form, as long as it is legal and it's registered by, this, by the central bank, bank, rather, you are good to go. You can wholly remit your profits and dividends as long as the investment is registered, as I said. You can also disinvest at 100% from Malawi, if you feel like maybe the business climate is not good enough anymore. And we also, as, 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 as a foreign investor, investor rather, you can also participate in initial public offerings, 10%, rising to 49% uh, later. So all this is there for, uh, as one way, uh, as, as some of the reforms to making sure that we attract more uh, investors. This is just a list of some of the laws that uh, uh, support that. Uh, the New Land Act also speaks to the same. As I said, as an investor, you can get land, and part of this land is uh, administered by the Malawi Investment and Trade uh, Center, where if you qualify and you present a good case, you can have land. The private-public uh, partnership is also there where you as a private investor can partner with government. Um, we have also established what we are calling competition and antitrust laws. So we have the Malawi uh, Competition and Fair Trade Commission, which makes sure that there is no monopoly, even in terms of, of the prices for commodities or whatever you are selling, should be within the the within the the regime the brackets for the I mean for for prices for such uh, uh, commodities during uh, that uh, time. We are also hosting the Common Market for East and Southern Africa Competition Commission, which allows all member states within Comesa to freely set their prices and trade in the region without any. Uh, uh, non-tariff uh, barriers. Um, expropriation and compensation. If you own land, that land can only be expropriated from you if maybe government wants to put some development projects in that area. Let's say there is a, there's a mine to be, um, if you want to have a mining uh, mining activities taking place in that area, then they might say, okay, we're getting this uh, maybe 50% of your land and you'll be uh, compensated. It could also be because you want to do some, uh, let's say maybe you want to build roads and other forms of infrastructure, then land could be uh, uh, expropriated. But otherwise, you don't just lose that without any um, compensation. We are also signatories to the New York Convention on Dispute Settlements between 
uh, traders and investors and, and other uh, interested persons. And um, finally, I want to talk about cross-cutting issues that we also factor in very much uh, as a country in our investment uh, uh, strategies. We always try to be climate smart in terms of our programming. Yeah, we try to. I know this should be something very interesting for someone. We have the Environmental Management Act that provides details on environmental requirements for investors. Uh, climate issues are integrated in public services and national development plans. And we have also established the National uh, Climate Change uh, Fund as a country. So what I'm giving you is not everything about what the country does, but something that relates to the uh, policy and legal uh, framework that makes the operating environment for investors kind of uh, enabling. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, thank you. Um, obviously, you know that I'm going to poke at this already. Um, you're prepared. Um, so you said you use this uh, say, phrase saying we are the Virgin of Africa. So why do the same mistakes, right? We, I'm going to go with your comparison. Why get want to get the STDs everybody else has, right? Sexually transmitted diseases. Um, if we look at our aquaculture. We know aquaculture massively pollutes oceans, massively pollutes water bodies. There is no aquaculture, now we're talking about fish, right? We're talking about factory farming for fish. None of this is done without heavy loads of antibiotics and heavy loads of other medicine that does pollute water. So the, bi the most precious thing I see there for the future is a huge body of water. So now there's like you talked about mining, mining heavily polluting industry. So if you have the most the future for the future, the most precious resource you can imagine in that like yeah, such a big water body, why do follow this everybody else and do the same mistakes? I I would wish for actually as a country to be like, we're beyond that. We saw what you did. We saw how, how all the country, other countries destroyed their environments. But I'm, what you presented, this is for me just the same path everybody took. Mm -hmm. Like opening up, like taking off tariffs, taking off barriers, um, while we already know what is going to happen, right? We know that water, not minerals, will be the most precious resource, or already actually is the most precious resource. Mm -hmm. Nobody, everybody can live without gold. Nobody can live without water. And um, you also talked about agriculture, right? So also um, to develop agriculture in a sustainable way using those water resources, uh, should be, in my opinion, a focus and not foreign investments. Because foreign investments are not interested in Malawi, right? They're not interested in uh, giving the people of Malawi a better life. They're interested in making money and profits. So all those things you talked about, like obviously the task was to talk about development, but all those things you talk about was like addressing some big capitalist country to come to exploit. So for me, this was ha most of the presentation was open arms. Um, come here and exploit the, uh, exploit our local resources, and hopefully we profit with this. It was like competing with other countries, saying, "Okay, we don't have barriers. We have e you go to one st one stop. You go to one stop. Everything is solved by you. You can do it quickly." It's for me. It looked like a quick road for exploitation, actually. Um, but I know this is not you, um, so I want, would like to hear your opinion. Um, like, how how can you find strike a balance with actually protecting this beautiful large body of water we saw there, and not follow the same way everybody else did? Thank you very much. And um, I was expecting such questions from you, and uh, I want to tell you that it is me speaking. And because I believe in what I'm talking about. For starters, uh, you know we should consider 
the, our environment as a common good. We know that, all of us. And we, you and I agree that uh, while Africa, Asia, and Latin America were there sitting, Europe, America, did a lot of harm to the same environment. And I would choose to differ where now we want to be good people and saying, no, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. If you look at the, the emissions that come from Africa, even Africa's contribution to carbon footprint, it's way, way below what comes from the weights. So Africa has always said, you know what? If you want us to transition from uh, activities that are det detrimental to the environment, can you do your fair share of carbon financing, or climate financing rather? We have gone to the COPs, COPs, you remember what happened during the Paris Agreement. USA later on pulled out. And if you look at the USA in the next, 2024 is gonna be very interesting. No, no, let, let, me, let me finish. Uh, you know I didn't talk about carbon emissions, right? Yeah, I yeah, talk about talk antibiotics about that, but, in your lake, but not I in want, the ocean. I want to go there. I want to say, much as we understand that we have to be smart, when we say people are coming to invest in our country, we don't mean we're not going to do anything like, you know, environmental impact assessments, those will be done. Those are prerequisites. Those are going to be done. But we also need to make two or three steps before we are told to say, you know what? No, stop this. Because our people are not going to be fed by campaigners of, of green energy, by campaigners who are saying, keep this water body safe. Our people are going to be fed by what comes from our natural resources. Um, just to like clarify my question, it was not. It was about conserving the local body for those people that live around, right? Um, because typically the road that goes is the money goes somewhere else to big investments, and um, the pollution is done also locally. I was not talking about carbon emission, coal power. Okay, mm. when we talk about coal power, let's say far, also coal power uses a lot of water. But if we talk about, I didn't say quit putting stuff into the atmosphere that does disperse very well, mm -hmm. right? I didn't talk about Paris. I purposely talked about something that locally you are dependent on. And mm -hmm. I, it was not a question of global south or global north. The global north also polluted their own rivers. Mm -hmm. When we look at like lots of rivers here, you mm -hmm. should not drink from them, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it was not a question from above, but it was a okay, question, so it was maybe a question in, about in short, what, what, what is it that is a concern? Is it that the lake, we are saying we're going to do aquaculture? Is it because we are saying we are inviting investors into our uh, mineral resources and we shouldn't do that? Is that what you're saying? Or um, I didn't understand I am, you. I am concerned that many other countries went this very same way and who ended up to suffer were the people that were locally dependent on that body of water who ended up to win and exploit were the big investment companies so i'm not i'm, I'm concerned about the locals actually preserving the environment for the future because it looks like when we look at the next 20 years Malawi is one of the best of world globally, given this body of water. Mm -hmm. But I think the only thing that makes them secure for the future is this pristine body of water. So if you destroy it, you're going to be screwed just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. If you manage it well, you're going to be globally way off in comparison. Then it might be like a small scale economy, but happy, healthy people, that's what I'm concerned with life expectancy locally, not with life expectancy globally, not with the Paris Agreement and who did everything else. I'm just concerned about like future justice for the people that live there. Yeah, but uh, we should also be, much as I understand that, but we should also be looking at when we talk about investing in aquaculture, for example, it might come with those challenges you're talking about, but there are some key freshwater fish species that 
actually were on the verge of, ex of, of uh, extinct. So we said, why don't we introduce uh, fish farming? This is what I'm talking about. We might have challenges, but every day, you know, we live in a world where new technologies and new solutions are, are, you know, are coming up every day. We are being mindful of that. Efforts are being put in place to make sure that we use these resources in the most sustainable way possible. I know we always get those campaigns you from, do know from green is oriented right? people. <laughs> and you are one of them, I know. No, we're, we're talking mm. about Corona, for instance. It's a no zoonotic, right? Mm. It's coming from farming. Mm. Uh, most of the diseases, pandemics globally, come from animal farming. Mm. All aquaculture mm. needs heavy use of antibiotics and so on. Mm. And who is going to get those antibiotic resistant bacteria? It's not going to be the global north. It's mm. going to be locals. Mm. And it's going to be more expensive. Prevention is always cheaper than to actually pollute and then clean up. The economy profits from cleaning up because it makes money to clean up, right? So money is created anyway. Can I suggest that we have this conversation later? Because there will be like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I have another question. Um, yes. Malawi is a very interesting location in Africa map. Uh, it means she will be interesting for somebody. What about the security? Tension today in Malawi. Well, how you comment that? I know you are economist, but the security is the same. The part of economy. Security concern. Are you talk security as in regional? For example, uh -huh. one of the partner, your India. What about relation? Yeah, India as a, and as Malawi. A trade, as yeah, a trade because partner. the problem of. A relationship with Tanzania, India, we already feeling the same problem. Uh, the who, the coast of Somali, you know this problem. I get it. <laughs> without state, uh, they are changing every time, every minute. How about Malawi feeling today? If I understood your question, I think you are looking at the. Um, you are looking at the. S the tensions in sub-Saharan Africa in general? No, only Malawi. Only Malawi. Malawi. I can tell you, um, Malawi, as domestically, I told you, we don't have any problems. Okay. And with our neighbors, we live in peace. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of bilateral discussions and agreements between Malawi and Tanzania, Malawi and Mozambique, Zambia, we are relatively better in that uh, element. There is something that I may not be very comfortable to comment on, but maybe I can, and I'll put a disclaimer to this. If you look at conflicts in Africa, for example, you see that we have conflicts in Niger, Burkina Faso, and all those other countries. I had to suggest that, is it something to do with the the country and the transition from colonialism to versus, versus the colonial massacre, because you don't see that in Anglophone countries. Eh? In Southern Africa, you, you don't see them in, in, in Zambia, in, in Botswana and other countries, but in West Africa, what could be the problem? So maybe this is one area that we need to dive into later to say what is the cause. And if you go to the Horn of Africa, and they are, if you, you talk of Eritrea and uh, Somalia, they might have more issues to do with maybe overpronounced ethnic issues that might not be the case in, in Southern Africa. The only thing that divides us in Southern Africa are those boundaries which are artificial, which were drawn by our colonial masters. But if you go to Zambia, to uh, Zimbabwe to Malawi, the life of culture, food, dressing, everything, is the same. So we don't even consider each other as Zambian or Malawian. And this has also helped us to bolster, you know, our, our integration in terms of uh, cross-border trade within the region. 
You may also wish to know that Malawi, Zambia, and Tanzania used to be one. Uh, no, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe used to be one country under the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Yeah. So it's not really a huge issue uh, in that area. The only concern, perhaps, I would be talking about some pockets of, of, of conflicts in the DRC, which could also have a sub-regional you know, uh, negative if, if impact. But right now, we are safe in that area. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have one question to ask, and then I hope you will give us a better answer, because this is a concern in Africa, all of Africa, not only one place. And Malawi is not an exception. Mm -hmm. Malawi is part of Africa, and everything that Africa has, Malawi has it. Mm -hmm. and you just mentioned that Malawi is having abundance of natural resources. But with all those natural resources, Africa, Africa is still being neglected by its own people. Because even our leaders, that is what, all, what they always do. They neglect our own people, focus on foreign direct investment, bringing investors inside our countries, investing, and then exploit our environment, our people, and then take back the profit to where they belong. So what are the measures Malawian government put in place to at least invest into their locals so that they can also be promoted to invest in other countries? I, I, I said something uh, like uh, one of the major strategies that we are doing is to invest in human capital, invest in our people. We have two universities right now whose focus is in extractive industry could be minerals, uh, minerals exploitation, making sure that our environment is, is taken uh, care of. Um, the Malawi investment, uh, Malawi University of Science and Technology, the University of Agriculture, Ukwadi Uluwana in Ilongwe. This is the focus. At the same time, we need to still remember that we live in a global world. The supply chains are not determined by one country. You could have other players that you also need for you to thrive. So we are also doing a lot in terms of ensuring that there is cross-learning, getting one, I mean, lessons from country A and, and from country B, also sharing what we have. We think this is, this is gonna be very important at our local level, building in our, in our people in terms of education, uh, skills that make them, you know, become um, smart in terms of responding to, to shocks. It could be exogenic as well as endogenic. So I don't know if that tried to answer your question. If you want me to kind of uh, dive into Africa, I would say, we are having a session after, after, I think after this later, maybe that could be the time for that also to be unpacked. Yes, uh, not only investing on, in uh, human capital, because if you invest in human capital development, it needs a lot of investment different from only human capital with regards to educational mm. development mm. or skill. When someone is having the skill and the person doesn't have the capital to start to venture into any meaningful, resourceful business, mm -hmm. it means the person is not even equipped enough to at least go into anything else. Mm -hmm. That will lead the person to go into this uh, journey we are talking about, this bag way and other, 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 other hazardous uh, uh, business or, or environment that the person might, might go into with regards to the youth fall. Because that is what most politicians are using with regards to the, po the political, uh, the, the crime rate in Africa now. So it's, is there any loan scheme that the Malawian government have for their youngsters to venture, to be, who want to venture into agriculture or mining sector? Thank you for being so direct at the end. We have the National Youth Empowerment Program and the National Economic Empowerment Program. These are uh, tailored uh, programs that give loans to the youth. In the previous year, I think about 70 billion was uh, Malawi Kwacha was distributed to the youth to do like a, a small scale businesses. And we also have another one under the Agricom, Agricom is the Agriculture Commercialization Program, which is bringing 
uh, graduates in agriculture together, for example, to open mega farms, and government gives them farm machinery and other forms of startup, startup capital, connecting them to, to the to markets. And as I also mentioned about the uh, accelerated growth corridors, it has subsectors as well. And one of the subsectors in this is making sure that there is efficiency in terms of value addition that makes these young graduates coming from, I mean, the young graduates are able to kind of get some, uh, some, some startups and then also employ others so that uh, that kind of, kind of reduces the burden and makes them stay in the country. Lastly, is that um, we also have the uh, Tiveta, that's technical, educational, and vocational. I think you know what I'm talking about. Under this arrangement, if youth graduate from what we are calling com community technical colleges, they are given some, uh, it's, it's like some form of affirmative action where you say, if you, if you graduate as a motor vehicle uh, mechanic, for instance, you can get a job to service uh, repair government vehicles. If you're a carpenter, you get jobs to repair, uh, like uh, to do the carpentry work within uh, the public sector as ways of trying to get there. But the biggest challenge is we can try within our limited resource envelope, but if we had more based on the results from the piloting program that we have, perhaps we could scale it up and have a larger part of our population benefiting from that. The concept of demographic dividend, we are really taking it seriously. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we do have him later on a panel too, and also um, he will be here the whole day, so you can also ask uh, in, with a coffee. Um, and for those future students of mine, um, just be prepared. I like to fry people. Um, so let's uh, give him another warm applause. <laughs>